Hey everyone, welcome to the Mobile User Acquisition Show. In the Mobile User Acquisition Show, we feature interviews with the smartest folks in mobile and growth who share invaluable, actionable, tactical insights on every aspect of mobile growth and marketing, not to mention some adjacent areas just as well. The Mobile User Acquisition Show is presented by me, Shaman Rao, CEO of the mobile growth marketing firm Rocketship HQ, and produced by Karishma Sundaram, our superstar content marketing manager at Rocketship HQ. Each episode includes strategies, tips, and pointers from the leading edge of mobile growth marketing that you can use to unlock tremendous growth for your app in a sustainable and capital efficient manner. Our guest today is Joanna Frota Korkoska, Data Ads Insights Analyst for G2A.com. Today, we talk about the intersection of fashion and gaming and how games have evolved from the relatively early simple days to the complex visual experiences that they are today. Joanna's interests lie in data and she spends her time researching behavior, behavior anal analytics, video game market analytics, and digital assets. In our conversation today, Joanna draws upon her vast experience with games to talk about the fashion and aesthetics related aspects of gaming and how digital spaces are evolving to become the metaverse, not just games. As a result of which, fashion and gaming are intertwined in never before ways today with games increasingly leaning into fashion and clothing related collectibles and fashion brands increasingly leaning into gaming. This was a wide ranging conversation, especially as we talk about the psychology that goes into purchasing in-app items, virtual collectibles and virtual fashion goods, a lot of which can exhibit very surprising behavior, some of which of course can be also exorbitantly priced. Would you purchase a $60,000 Counter-Strike skin? If you say no, join the counters by saying, not yet. Well, for a very nuanced understanding of... I am very excited to welcome Joanna Frota Kurkowska to the Mobile User Acquisition Show. Joanna, welcome to the show. Good morning or good afternoon. <laughs> Yeah, or good night, wherever people are listening in to this podcast from. The time zones are crazy, so you know. Yeah, I'm very excited to have you because you certainly have a very unique perspective on an aspect of gaming around aesthetics that I don't think is necessarily front and center, but it is so important and so critical. And I noticed and realized that after having spoken to you and after having read what you've written, so I'm very, very thrilled to have you, Joanna. And a good place to start exploring today's theme could be to start by talking about some of the early games like Pong, Pac-Man, Space Invaders. These were not any sort of visual or aesthetic experiences. So at what point in the evolution of gaming did aesthetics or the visual experience start to become important enough that we are actually talking about the interplay between gaming and fashion today. The early games, like you mentioned, Frogger or Pong, they had very simple graphics and none of that went with fashion. The only clothes that I can remember from those days is Mario the Plumber's uniform. And yeah. that is the only piece of fashion I can remember. It's like a couple of pixels and nothing else. The moment that it struck me that fashion and gaming go on together and well together are in the 90s when I started playing Japanese RPG games. In the 90s, they were very fashion oriented, at least for me. I played loads of European or American games like City, Warcraft, Polish productions. They were complex or semi-complex, but they didn't have this fashion aspect. And when you yeah. look at the JRPG industry, there is always this fashion aspect, especially for me. And especially when you look at Final Fantasy VII, and from that moment, they changed the Kara designer there from Shitaka Amano to Tetsuya Nomura, 
who was very fashion oriented. If you read interviews with him, he's into fashion. He loves his belts, jackets, etc., etc. And if you look at the designs, because until this day, Amano does some illustration for Final Fantasy series. And his illustrations are more or of fantasy, sci-fi stuff oriented. And Nomura mm. always goes more into fashion. This is the mm. obvious aspect. Even one of his other games, I think it was The World Ends With You for the DS. It mm. has fashion literally in its DNA. So yeah. I take the 90s and Jair RPGs, the moment for me when I discovered this is cool. This is this fashion moment. And later, the second one, when it comes to out of like Japanese markets oriented gaming, are The Sims. You had to buy clothes for your sim. You had to play some designer role, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So The Sims for me was the first title out of Japan, out of like the market, different from the market that had this fashion aspect. The first Sims were released in 2000 or somewhere around. And Final Fantasy VII was 97. So definitely these are the yeah. three years which were more fashion oriented. It's still not the thing that it is today, but there were the first games that were definitely in the zone of fashion. Certainly. I imagine this is also when games in general started to become more visual. And uh, it certainly makes sense that accessories like clothing and style started to become much more prominent, that was much more clearly visible as elements of the games themselves. Although I would guess at this point of time in the 90s or the early 2000s, we still weren't at a stage where digital fashion accessories were a thing, which is the case today. So the digital accessories, you can buy them as $2 IAP, but you can also buy, let's just say, Counter-Strike skin that sold for $60,000 as a collectible item. So... Help me understand what were some of the key transition points that took us from early RPGs, early Japanese games, these look really stylish, these look really chic, to we will pay for maybe a $2 IAP or a $60,000 Counter-Strike skin. The obvious answer to this question is the development of technology. And the gaming in general. If you had the early gaming, it was just player versus player games. There wasn't a large market for gadgets, etc. And there wasn't also internet. So how could you buy some things if you couldn't get to a store or something like that? Right. And I think the main answer, the clue to this question is the rise of the internet, the development of e-commerce and transferring some buying habits from our traditional lives to mm-hmm. our gaming lives. Of course, we can add pandemic from the last year, but if you look at the data, there are some data on that. For example, spending in mobile games just rose tremendously. The same on the DLC content, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. People are closed in their homes and they cannot go to a store. They cannot meet with people, so they don't need new clothes. Yeah. But they're playing lots of Animal Crossing. They're playing lots of Fortnite. They're playing Call of Duty, as you said. They're playing yeah. Roblox. So their digital personas go out more than their physical self. I, I don't recall any moment of history that this happened. Yeah. So I think the rise of internet and mm-hmm. mobile communication, plus, of course, the pandemic during the last year. Because if, if you look at the data, the global customing spending solely for mobile rose 28 percent comparing to 2019 to 2020 the rise of spending mobile games almost 30 percent but it's also for other things like coins that you can buy things inside the game roblox has a system that you buy a robux there and then you can spend it on digital accessories and and etc so this would be my answer to your question yeah so the internet happened and certainly digital transactions are easier. Of course, the, the development of payments. For example, in Poland in the 90s or early 2000s, when you wanted to order something, you could even have the money, but there was a yeah. problem with the payments. You could use checks, etc., etc. And I remember the moment when PayPal came in. And it was like a whole new world opening for us. And currently with other systems, like digital payments, 
or even cryptocurrencies. Shopping is just going and choosing the, the way you want to pay. It's shocking how it's changed in a good way. Yeah, okay. certainly. I grew up in India where to some extent we still have payment problems, but it's changed dramatically since mm -hmm. PayPal and digital payments. Mm -hmm. We talked about how people are more open and willing to buy in-game fashion accessories. What are some of the key motivations behind these purchases? Why are people buying this? I, I mean, I wouldn't buy a $60,000 Counter-Strike yes. uh, skin <laughs> yet, yet, yeah, I may have spoken too soon, but what are some of the key motivations and why do people buy these things? This is also interesting because when I talk with my friends and they're always, I wouldn't buy a, a digital dress or a skin for even a couple of hundreds of dollars. Uh, and I'm talking to them, but you bought some Nikes or Reeboks or Pumas or other famous brands for a couple of hundreds of dollars. And yeah, but they're physical. And I say, okay, but the production cost of this shoe is five or 10 or $20, right? Yeah. Which I hope will rise because of the payment that go to, goes to workers and they are, yeah, but it's physical, etc. But again, if you're a sneaker collector, which many of my friends are, and you have thousands of shoes or hundreds or tens, uh, doesn't matter. You buy the emotion. You cannot, you won't wear them. If you see the MTV Cribs or those programs where people just go through their flats or houses and you can see those large storages with their shoes, they won't wear it. And I think you're buying an emotion the whole feeling of buying things and owning it. And this also applies to buying NFTs, NFTs so non-fungible tokens. Yeah. The hot thing right now in cryptocurrency. So this is solely emotion. The other is the purpose of it. If we're talking about digital fashion, solely in gaming, for example, some of the skins or guns or swords give you better stats. Uh huh. So mm -hmm. if you buy it, you get better in your game. That used to be the main motivation for buying things 10 years ago. There was this mm -hmm. online game called Tibia or even the famous World of Warcraft. People were just swapping things, weapons, armors, etc. And this was for the usability of it. You could smash your enemies, you'll get better at game. On the other hand, for example, you have games like Fortnite, when those skins do not add anything to your statistics. Mm -hmm. They just are there. So one may say it's just being vain because you want to be different. It's just clothing, etc. On the other hand, it's a meeting place for you and your friends. You always want to dress up for the occasion. For example, when I talk with my friend's kids, the parents are always complaining, how is it that my kid spends uh, $100 on Fortnite skins? And I'm like talking with them. Why did you do it? And he said, that's for him. It's like a way to get dressed for going out because we're in lockdown currently and he doesn't have a place to go. And he likes yeah. some cool fashion and it's card collectibles also for them. He collected the old outfits and it's got this collector's yeah gene or something ah, people have collecting yeah, stamps yeah, yeah, yeah. this may also be that right yeah. one person can collect stamps the other person can collect fortnite skins mm -hmm. if you look also at the data when it comes to collecting when it comes to spending of dlcs and dlcs and it's from statista 2021 buying currency is the first one so people pay most for the currencies in gaming which again as i told you before they spend the in-game currency also for clothes, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And the second biggest thing they're spending their money on, the DLCs, et cetera, skin, wardrobe, and cosmetic upgrades. So it mm -hmm. doesn't have anything in common with being better in a game. It's just like, I'm cool, I feel better, et cetera. And this is interesting that essential items like travel vessels, vehicles, et cetera, are the last ones. <laughs> so it's, wow. it's, yeah the weapons are the third one so th they divided it a little bit different so yeah the weapons are the third one but other essentials are the last after clothing yeah. and currency wow so you can see, uh, yeah so this is crazy yeah so the status or how you come across to other players matters so much i think the example you gave of the sneaker collectors is a great one because like you said nobody wears those sneakers it's as much a virtual collectible 
Okay. Nobody takes them out of the box sometimes because yeah. if you take it out of yeah. the box, I think the price drops. I'm not a sneakerhead myself, but I know that it, it's like with the game that the games are in the foil and the shoes are also in the box with the special yeah. things around it. When you take it out, I think it's like 20 or even 40% of price droplet or something. Yeah, it's crazy, yeah, yeah. crazy. It's insane. And other thing with it is important. Sneakers, mm. they own a lot of place in your home. Literally, yeah. they own, because if you have a lot of sneakers, you have to have a sneaker room, of course. Yeah. In gaming, it's very easy because you have only the digital space. Sure. Uh, that's also an yeah. interesting aspect. Yeah, so you talked about how weapons are the number one sort of consumable. Essentials are the last, clothing is second, generally in games. So even within clothing, there's a wide spectrum. I gave the example of the Counter-Strike skin, and I'm no, there are things that sell for hundreds of thousands. So what are some of the drivers that can make an in-game article of clothing more valuable or less valuable? My take on this is just one word. It's rarity. There's this great example from Fortnite. I think the skin that is currently the first or in the like top five of the most expensive Fortnite skins it's nothing out of ordinary. The design is there, but it was just available during the first season. And because it was nothing special, almost nobody bought it. And now the quantity of it, it's scarce. Rarity would be for me the point, yeah. point one of this. Second, right. if we're looking from example, uh, I'm not a Call of Duty player, so Mm -hmm. I might be mistaken on that, but maybe the usage in the game. I think it might be some improvement for your character or for your yeah. game. But I think the rarity is more crucial, not only because of this current state, because uh, it used to be popular, now it's scarce, etc. But for the future, I think the more games will be released, the more we'll see games being released as a social platform. For me, Fortnite is a social platform. Surprisingly for me, when people talk about the metaverse, nobody says about Call of Duty as a social platform or even a thing that can be a part of the metaverse. And I think mm -hmm. lots of people just play Call of Duty because it's a social platform and meetup space. So uh -huh. again, as more games like this will be released, yeah. more pieces to collect or to improve your games will be available there and more rare items will also be there and things that can improve your game. Interesting. So it sounds like it's how rare the item yeah. is that is the key determinant. And something else that's interesting that you touched upon is it's not just a game, it's a way for players to hang out and chill. Earlier on in this conversation, you said, look, many real life events that happen virtually now, like real life, certainly this is true of simulation like Roblox or Sims and things like that. But as you said, even Call of Duty, people just go hang out and chill. And shoot people in this. It's shoot people. Yeah, I know. Great way, want... yeah, great way to chill. Just a couple yeah. of dudes killing people. Yeah, that's funny. I was talking to somebody and they were trying to say, look, how do we make this game more cooperative and collaborative? And this is not a shooting game. I was sitting on this conversation, but one of the persons was like, the only collaborative games that have succeeded have been the ones where you shoot people. There are no non-violent collaborative games. I have to quarrel with that because there's this one great game. You're not killing anybody and I, you're very collaborative. It's called Overcooked. Have you played Overcooked. it? I have not. I have to check that out. Okay. It's a cooking game, I think, for max for players. Oh, interesting. I will have to check that out. You can get lit on fire. You can catch a fire in the kitchen All and right. you're dead. Yeah, there's some violence, not as much, okay? <laughs> but it's inevitable in, in the kitchen. But this is also a way, I don't remember whether it has a multiplayer online, mm -hmm, etc. Mm -hmm. But it's a good collaborative when you're at your home with friends, apparently, yeah. which you cannot do right now. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but the meeting space is crucial. Digital assets and meeting places in gaming are inseparable. When I'm looking at loads of mobile games talks, because I'm not a fan of mobile games myself, I don't play them, but I'm very interested in trends, data, the industry as a whole, because it's very interesting for me as a researcher. And what's interesting me that there's this focus on data, like user acquisition, et cetera, et cetera. 
and very few titles are aiming to be the social platforms. And I think in the in times where many people are dissatisfied with social media, Facebook, Twitter, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, they're looking for new places to meet people. And I think gaming as a social service, gaming as social platforms, is the way to go there. And with the gaming as a social platforms, the whole e-commerce will also move there. Okay, maybe not the whole e-commerce, but yeah. many of the companies, other kinds of advertisements, etc., cetera, yeah. will move there. So I think that apart from the things that the mobile industry tries to do, like all the data retention, there should be this thinking about how to make our game a social platform. Not only that the yeah. user want to return once a week or five minutes a day, but wants to engage in it. I really yeah. like the fact, for example, again, it's Fortnite, but... Uh, did you know that in Fortnite there is an option when you're doing the battle royale thing with your friends and for example you're driving you cannot participate you can push the voice mode so you can only hear mm -hmm. what's going on and participate in the conversation hence you're participating with your voice not with your gun and you're not thrown out of, out of the action so this for me is also like gaming as a social platform and using your voice and audio as yeah. a social platform we've seen it with Clubhouse yeah and this is really a big opportunity nowadays. I know Facebook does another social media. They do lots of good things for the mobile industry, but maybe it's the time to look beyond just the, the classical mobile game thinking yeah. and thinking more about, let's call it social platforming them. Yeah. One of the games that I wrote about in my presentation, the COVID fashion, what surprised me, the game was very cool, etc. But when I entered their YouTube, it was like entertainment channel. It was mostly yeah. videos from their meetups, mm -hmm. which struck me because there was little of gaming, like in gaming footage. And those were mostly meetup media. Of course, it was before the pandemic. So they had meetings in real life. I don't have slightest clue how they do it now, but I think forums like Reddit are their meeting space. Maybe Discord or something like that. But there, I think they were aiming for the players who don't consider them as players, but people who want to be binded by the common hobby, which is mm -hmm. fashion. Mm -hmm. And for me, I think that's very interesting thing to look uh, up in the future. Mm -hmm. People are always thinking about esports, etc., as this big uh, competitions, people meeting up and stuff. But I think there's this trend that people do not see mobile games as a social mm -hmm, platform. Mm -hmm, I think mm -hmm. many games have potential to do this. Even if uh, a match-free format, yeah. which I love, I'm a total match-free nerd, it's evolving with project makeover, etc. Why not take it more into the way with more social aspect? Yeah. And with that, I think the whole e-commerce will go. And getting back to the main topic of this call, the whole e-commerce connected with digital clothes. So you could buy not only clothes that is in-game. For example, I would love to buy a jacket from Final Fantasy, but you can also buy real clothing by other brands that it's like in the game. So I think that's it. I really, I think that digital fashion, digital assets are not to be looked at just like it's just digital fashion and nothing else. You've got e-commerce, yeah. you've got the social aspects you've got the community yeah. aspect so when for example when you've got a company that's designing a game like fashion oriented yeah. game i'm just blueprinting right now they have to sit down and think about it what's the aim of creating this game how will the development go maybe do a roadmap this is that i really love when it comes to cryptocurrency projects mm -hmm. a good yeah. cryptocurrency project has a roadmap for a half a year or a year or even a couple of years, if, if they're very ambitious. Yeah. And for example, if I read it, I know what's going to happen. Then the time passes, I see what they accomplished. And it makes me more involved with the digital assets. And I think the same would go with gaming. I'm very interested in titles that would be developed together with the community, which is very hard because it's usually the way that you develop a title and you build a community around it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And how to make, in mobile gaming, build game. And at the same time, start building a community. I know niche titles on Twitter do it, but it's totally niche gaming. On computers, when it comes to PC gaming and Steam, there's this great example of uh, Darkest Dungeon, 
which was in early access in Steam, and the creators were tweaking the games together with their community, which wasn't always the best. There's this documentary on the game development, and they wanted good, but the community was very strict about some things, mm -hmm. and it led to some quarrels. But I'm very interested how it would go in mobile gaming, how yes. teams would take this obstacle or challenge head on. But I leave it as an open question. And I yeah. hope someday somebody will send me a link with such a project. Yeah, certainly. Let's just say there's a gaming company. They're not very fashion intentional at this point in the game. Okay. Maybe they're a mastery game. Maybe they even have characters, but they're like, now we want to ensure there are fashion forward collectibles in our game going forward. We want to have that as part of our strategy. What are some of the questions they should be asking? What are some of the key decisions that they should be considering making? I'm the kind of person that would ask them questions. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so what would you ask them? Yeah, what so, would you ask? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think everybody knows some answers. If we're talking about a good team that's done some work together, they know each other, and I'll just sit down with them or they should mm -hmm. sit down with each other. And talked, what's the purpose of this game? Are we doing more niche, more indie title? Or we're going like with Project Makeover did. When they released the game, that they already did a partnership page. So if you're a brand, contact us, etc., etc. So I just think whether it's a gaming that should be a social platform. So the, the core design and from this core design that we've talked over, more questions and adding more notes. So mm -hmm. for example... Are we going to do all around fashion, like street style or like elegance or glamour or boho or et cetera? What's our core audience? Are there any niches that have not been covered? Because when we're talking about fashion, like gaming fashion, there are niches. There is, for example, this game, I think it's called Fashion Police. It looks like Quake or Doom or Duke Nukem. Instead of shooting people, you shoot something and it changes the dress of the person. Oh, wow. I think it's early access on stream. I don't know if I said the name correctly, but I found it really funny and interesting, but it's, it's total niche, right? Yeah. And, but I think it has the potential for a professional partnership with a fashion brand. Yeah. yeah. I totally see Balenciaga or Gucci doing something like that with the people who made the game. Like, yeah. bang, you're in Gucci swag. Be totally awesome. Yeah. So, this, so I think I would decide whether we're creating an art project, a niche project, an indie game, or a mobile game. Let's be honest, that will bring our company money and it will be also a stable source of revenue for us. So maybe we can mm -hmm. work on this game constantly, do some add-ons, do some partnerships, etc. So I'd go yeah. this way. Yeah, certainly. Like you said, I think asking those questions to clarify what they want and where they want to be, that's the most important thing. If you were to look at this from the perspective of a fashion brand, and you alluded to some of those just now, and let's just say they're like, this is Gucci, somebody that they're like, oh, we want to be a part of gaming, because maybe they heard this podcast, maybe they're like, we want to be a part of gaming. What are some of the questions they should ask themselves, or what are some of the questions you would ask them to make sure they're approaching this right? I think Gucci is an easy way or Balenciaga because they already participate in the market. And if you're participating in the market, you're familiar with the market one or another way. I think th these are the companies that know how to talk with gaming companies and know gaming. And what's most important, they get gaming. So they have this touch that's very good. But I think the main problem would be if I'm in a fashion company that's never done a game, knows nothing. Just like, I've seen that you can do some stuff in Animal Crossing. Let's do that. Let's jump on the bandwagon. I'm just giving the Animal Crossing example because many brands showed up there because it's free. Yeah. And you can only start your island. But other people just started their island and nothing else. But many brands did it very smartly and they partnered with an influencer from inside. But this is not gaming uh, uh, yeah. aspect. But this is like they're participating in gaming as a partner, etc. I think I'd start partnering with somebody, testing what's the return of investment from there. Just maybe not Animal Crossing, maybe other game 
And mm -hmm. then looking, what's the sentiment of the comments on the internet? What's happening with our participation in the game? You can get hard data from it. Every, yeah. It's not a problem. So looking at the data and look how you feel personally, because even if it won't be a huge success, it may be a niche thing for you. You might see that, oh, it's interesting. It works to some extent. Let's do more yeah. experiments. And from that moment on, I'd focus on finding a developer or a dev group that gets gaming and mm -hmm. is very communicative and can work with our designers. This is pretty interesting case you said, because when fashion brands partnering with game designers, programmers, et cetera, and the company already has designers on both sides. You have a designer in the gaming company and in the fashion sure. company. So this can make things either easier because there are both creative minds or harder because they are both creative minds and they have their opinions. Yeah. But I'd do this this way. First experiment, do some experimentation in other games. Maybe find your niche. I think the next few years might be really a niche thing. When it comes yeah. to fashion, remember the market is growing. Last year saw 50 million new gamers, people who never gamed, wow. never touched the console or even the game on a mobile folder. They started playing. So the market is expanding. There is still much more to do yeah. and there's a room to grow. So I think for a fashion brand, it's really important to find their niche and maybe rather than putting some generic thing, or even if you work in a generic market, like match free gaming, maybe add some their, or their own tweak to it. There are a few examples like the Balenciaga game, which totally just blew my mind. It wasn't a perfect game, but the fact that a brand did it and yeah. the launch date was similar to the, the launch date of Cyberpunk 27.7. Yeah. Until this day, I'm just asking myself, is it a coincidence or not? I believe not, but who yeah. knows? Mm and has this vibe and had everybody talking of it. Because if you look at fashion and gaming, I don't think there is a, a material released after December that had not mentioned this title. Yeah. This was something new for fashion users, fashion mm -hmm. fa aficionados, etc., etc. Many of them are gamers, many of them are not. And so this is breaking borders, breaking all the conventions and doing something yeah. new, experimenting. But before you experiment, you have to be absolutely sure in my opinion, that you are worthy to do it, your brand will fit into the digital space somewhere. One of my favorite quotes ever, the digital space today is vast and infinite. It's from Ghost yeah. and Michelle. And there are so many types of niche games, commercial games, commercial titles. And I think this year we'll also see a release of other titles, which can be played again and again for the next couple of years. I think people have to understand that it's cool for a game to have 100 million players, but it's also cool for a game to have two or three million players. Yeah. If the players are playing the game constantly, you have a solid source of revenue, you have a social platform, and you have a way to promote your brand. But And it has to be all done in style and it's in a good taste because people today, they see if something's not of a quality and if it's something that's done because it had to be done, there are some projects yeah. that just have to be done, people will know and they will just not like it. I was researching the fashion and gaming, loads of examples like Fortnite, Nike and Roblox, even the events are happening in the metaverse. And I was yeah. amazed that there was literally very, very, very few negative comments about it. Yeah. Of course, there is always another place for brands to show off their work. But for example, if you're scrolling for Facebook on Instagram, I get totally, excuse my language, pissed off when I see commercial, 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 etc. And I'm really very much more, maybe not happy, but I'm not so much irritated by a product placement in games. Yeah. or in movies for that matter, if they're done in a good way, not yeah. totally obvious, then from those Facebook click only ads. I think advertising for gamers can be more fun and efficient than just putting some Google ads and Facebook ads, but it's just my opinion. Yeah. And they're more happy to buy Nikes. I'd be happy yeah. to buy Nikes in Fortnite or something like that. Roblox campaign was very good. They had nice design and it can correspond with you. You have your own Nikes. It's in your house yeah. right or something yeah. like that yeah yeah so it's, it's yeah. pretty cool yeah and you know like i said i think a lot of the in-game brand placements 
if they're careful enough, they can make it appear very native, very non-intrusive. So I imagine that feels less jarring than just an ad, let's just say on Facebook. That was the yeah. word intrusive. Yeah. So that was the word I was looking for. That's totally yeah. not like in Facebook and you can engage in this. Again, this is the social platform. We have ads, we have social interactions, even the social interactions. You only have it with people you want. And in Facebook or Twitter, sometimes other people are coming in, etc., cetera, et cetera. Mm-hmm. And in Fortnite, it's rather people, you know, plus some other people, but not on the scale as Facebook and Twitter plus ads. So again, the advertisement, but not so intrusive. That's the word I was looking for. So this is pretty interesting. I'm really interested how with, for example, the rise of cloud gaming, which I'm doing a research on now, how it will have an impact on democratizing of gaming and bringing in more gamings and more opportunities. The same goes for mobile gaming, how it will develop, how AAA titles will do partnerships with brands. GTA 5 is a great example. They did this GTA online thing. And I read this article that GTA 5, which was released, I think, eight years ago, mm-hmm. is still selling millions of copies and it's going to wow. sell till the, till the end of the world. Because they wow. release something new every month. Everybody are saying the game should run in 100 FPS or 1000 FPS, whatever works at this moment. It should have this graphic that will be so real, etc., etc. And again, GTA 5, which has graphics that aren't cyberpunk level graphics, but it's still selling. So I strongly believe that it's not about the graphics, not about the aesthetics of the game, but the core. And the core of the gaming is fun and the constant development. And of course, the social aspect, that's the future. It's no longer player versus player in the arcade or sitting alone with your PlayStation at home and just ringing your friends on your phone that's sitting at his or her house and playing the same game, but you cannot play it online yeah. because there's no online mode. It's funny because when I talk with kids that are around eight, I show them, for example, Super Nintendo games. I'm like, you said that you couldn't play online like on Super yeah. Nintendo. I think the younger generation, they don't see possibility of playing not online. Even for the fact that, for example, on PlayStation, you have the trophy system, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You have the trophy system and you can show people that you're a good gamer and you have loads of trophies. Yeah, there was a time before the internet. (laughs) I certainly remember that time. I certainly (laughs) remember playing. And we are certainly getting into some very interesting and exciting times. We have the front seats, man. Absolutely. I'm excited to see what happens next. Joanna, this has been... So wide-ranging and so eye-opening for myself, and I'm sure it will be for folks that listen in. I know we are coming up on time, so this is perhaps a good place for us to start to wrap. Thank you for sharing everything that you did. I speak to very, very few people that have seen such a wide expanse of games and are able to speak about these games with this sort of authority that you've been able to speak to. So thank you for that. As we wrap, can you tell folks how they can find out more about you and everything you do? They could find me on LinkedIn. You can type Frota and you'll find me. Currently, like my main web page is dataglitch.games. And I'm working as a data insights analyst at g2a.com. Plus, Mm -hmm. of course, the best place on the web, which is Twitter, where I go by the nick of Frotograph. So Frotograph. And I'm the girl in the rabbit hat. You can find me easily. Excellent. Girl in the rabbit hat. Very cool Twitter handle, photograph. I hope my stream of consciousness helped somebody or if you're interested, just don't hesitate to write to me on LinkedIn or Twitter. I'll be happy to talk about the digital assets topic because I'm really, really interested in it. And I really, again, want to remind us all that we have the front seat to the change that's currently happening. Thank you very much, Mans. Thank you, Joanna. For more tips pointers and strategies from the leading edge of mobile user acquisition. Subscribe to our YouTube channel right here or check out our blog rocketshiphq.com slash blog.